Let's talk the neuroscience of heartbreak, only here on the People Scientist Podcast. Listening to the People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on neuroscience, physiology, and nutrition. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, a nutritionist, physiologist, and neuroscientist, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, my People Scientist Army, and welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast for episode 143, where I aim to share some scientific information so that we can all become a little bit smarter and a little bit healthier with every new episode. How are we feeling today? Is your day going okay? Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of your day, and I hope that I can give you something interesting to ponder. So last episode, in episode 142, we talked about the neuroscience of trust and vulnerability in relationships, whether that be family, romantic, or even work relationships. And seeing as we are still in the month of February, and Valentine's Day makes this month the theme of love, I wanted to continue on this topic, but somewhat from the opposite side, as we are going to talk about the neuroscience of heartbreak. Chances are, all of us at some point are going to experience the feeling of heartbreak, whether that be from a breakup of a romantic relationship, the end of a friendship, or the loss of a family loved one. One could view heartbreak as an immense sadness when we have lost someone special in our lives. So I was pondering, what exactly is heartbreak? Why do some of us experience stronger heartbreak than others? What is the neuroscience behind that? And can we use that understanding to our advantage to help us better cope with the feelings of heartbreak in the future? So how about we get into that? But before we do, let's start off with a foregone fact where I share scientific finding from long ago. All the way back in 1866, so 157 years ago, Julius Alfaus published in the British Medical Journal his thoughts on hysteria. So over 150 years ago, physicians reported seeing cases of hysteria in women. They noted that the cases of hysteria presented as labored breathing, heart palpitations, wringing of the hands, loss of strength in the legs, and feeling a lump in the throat. At the time, the physicians did not have a very good understanding of what they were seeing. They actually believed that this hysteria was due to a uterus not being in use, so when a woman was not pregnant. Isn't that so surprising? 157 years later, this seems so outlandish and horrible. The treatment for hysteria as written in this report? Theridization, they call it. This is essentially alternating electrical shocks. They would literally shock the women with electricity in the event of hysteria to bring them to a more calm state of mind. And later, when drugs like opioids and cocaine were isolated and available, sometimes these drugs were administered to women for hysteria as well. Today, we are far smarter, far more enlightened, and more ethical, and realize that these episodes of intense emotional pain can be due to a multitude of things, such as a loss of a loved one, witnessing a tragedy, psychiatric illness, or exposure to mood-altering substances. Reading old studies like this makes me so grateful to live in a world where medicine is far more advanced today. But at the same time, can we imagine in 150 years what people in the future may look back on in shock that we are doing today? Perhaps the way we do surgery or our limited ability to diagnose and treat mood disorders will seem so archaic and shocking to them in the future. What do you think we do today in medicine that will seem shocking in 150 years? Now, how about we get into the core takeaways of today's topic, 
on the neuroscience of heartbreak. Heartbreak is thought to result from the loss of a valuable relationship. That can be from a friend moving away, a loved one passing away, or the end of a romantic relationship. The loss of a valuable relationship can have us feeling as though we are in a disorganized, chaotic state, leaving us wondering, what am I to do without this person in my life now? In fact, many brain imaging studies indicate that the same brain regions that are recruited during physical pain are also recruited with emotional pain and heartbreak. As a result, emotional pain or heartbreak can have an impact on our physical health too. In this episode, I go through those details, how emotional pain relates to pain disorders that we have yet to fully understand, like fibromyalgia. I also talk about how this understanding may help us in being able to better cope with heartache in the future. Now, how about we get into those scientific details? It is thought that relationships help us maintain psychological and physiological balance. We build a routine around our relationships. We may look to our relationships for support in different ways. That can be emotional support, like someone to give advice and a listening ear. It can be a partner to do activities with, a partner to hold us accountable to a healthy lifestyle. As a result, a loss of a relationship can send us into a disorganized state. And a lot of times, the end of a relationship can make us ponder, what do I do now without this person in my life? How do I carry on without the support that I was used to? So you might imagine then that a potential strategy to help reduce the severity of heartache is independence. That means being the source of our own psychological and physiological well-being. That we are the source of our own happiness, our own health, our own achievements. Relying on another individual for our needs and happiness may set us up for severe heartache if the relationship falters. Because if we rely on another person for our happiness and we lose that person, then we lose our happiness. At the same time, I think it is very important to make a distinction here that dependence is different from vulnerability. Vulnerability in a relationship can be good. Some people may mistake dependence for vulnerability in a relationship. We don't necessarily want to be very dependent on someone in a relationship for our happiness and health, but we do want to display some vulnerability. Why? I talk about this in the last episode. We want to be independent and have our own emotional and psychological well-being in our own hands. However, opening up and being vulnerable in relationships can also be a very key component in the development of trust in a relationship. Strong relationships are built upon trust, and trust requires vulnerability. How can we trust someone has our back, unless we leave our back exposed to them? Being vulnerable can look like being honest, and being honest even when it is difficult. Talking about our past or our personal aspirations, sharing of ourself. But at the same time, being our own source of happiness and stability. So I hope that that distinction is clear. That independence may somewhat protect us from severe heartache, but vulnerability is distinct and is an important part of a relationship. But even if we do everything right, and that we are the source of our own happiness and stability, losing someone in our life still hurts. We can't really get around that or avoid that. Maybe if we can understand this better, then we can cope with heartache better. So let's get into the science of heartache. Tilova in 2015 in the journal Brain Mapping wrote about how the brain feels the pain of heartbreak. It is intriguing that heartbreak seems to hold many similarities to physical pain. Just think of the words or phrases that we use to to describe situations around heartbreak. Words like crushing, agony, phrases like it was a slap in the face. Can you think of any other words or phrases that we use to describe heartache? The language that we use around heartbreak seems to be very physical, isn't it? Is there a natural inclination for us to describe heartache this way because it really is physical pain? Well, it turns out that social disconnection, or even the threat of social disconnection, hurts in a very real way because it recruits some of the same neural mechanisms that respond to physical injury. 
In other words, there is a neurobiological overlap between heartache or social pain and physical pain. As humans, we are deeply social species. We take great satisfaction in having social bonds. This need is rooted in evolution. One can have a better chance of surviving if they have the good company of those to support them. At times in history, the social circle was more important than one's own physicality, stronger as a whole than as one alone. As such, the breaking of a valuable social bond feels aversive. We don't like it. We want to avoid it. Pain is an evolutionary signal. It serves the purpose of limiting damage to the body. And it is hypothesized that this physical pain signal may have been co-opted to alert humans and other social mammals to the possibility of damage to one's social relationships. We have a system in our body that regulates pain called the opioid system. And we produce natural opioids within our body called endorphins and enkephalins. Our natural opioid system exists to reduce pain and to improve mood. We can naturally raise our endorphins and enkephalins with things like exercise, a warm or hot bath, massage, music, and laughter. Drugs that are opioids like oxycodone, morphine, heroin, or fentanyl can hijack this system and activate it too. So why is it that scientists believe heartache actually causes physical pain? Well, there are many experiments that illustrate the importance of the opioid system within our body for social bonds and social pain too. For example, many battling with opioid addiction claim that their heartache and feelings of guilt and sadness disappear when they take opioids such as morphine, oxycodone, or heroin. This is a potential motivating factor for individuals to develop an addiction to opioid drugs because it could alleviate their emotional pain too. Secondly, scientists have noted in preclinical studies that modulating the opioid receptors can influence the ability for social bonding and vocalization of pain. So a system within our body that we believe to modulate physical pain may actually modulate emotional pain too. Kroos in the journal PNAS in 2011 conducted a really interesting neuroimaging study. They recruited 40 individuals that very recently experienced a bad breakup in which they still felt intense pain from the breakup. The scientists wanted to understand how recent heartbreak was coded by the brain. They also wanted to compare this to physical pain. So they had the individuals undergo functional magnetic resonance imaging of their brain, as this will give insight as to what brain regions will be recruited during certain tasks. So what were those tasks? Well, the scientists wanted to scan their brain while they acutely felt the heartache of the breakup. So the scientists had showed the individuals a picture of their ex and asked them to think of a specific painful moment of rejection in that relationship. Then they looked at what brain regions were recruited during this pain of heartbreak. They compared this to when the individual was asked to look at a photo of their friend and to think of a recent positive experience. Now to assess how the brain responded to physical pain, the participants had a painful heat applied to their forearm, which they scored an 8 out of 10 for pain. As a control, they applied warmth to their forearm that was rated a 2 out of 10 for pain. The scientists looked at which brain regions were recruited during this physical pain task too. Remarkably, the scientists saw significant neurobiological overlap, meaning the same brain regions recruited during feelings of heartache were also recruited in a similar manner as physical pain. These brain regions included the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, the anterior insula, and the thalamus. So what are the implications of this research? I think that these results give new meaning to the idea that social rejection and breakups physically hurt. This may provide us more insight, better understanding and empathy for others when they are dealing with heartache. In addition, the authors speculate that these findings offer new insight into how social rejection or heartbreak may lead to various physical pain disorders that we don't yet completely understand. For example, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a chronic pain condition in which the etiology, the cause, is not fully understood. So this research on emotional pain being coded similarly as physical pain raises the question, is it possible that individuals with fibromyalgia have undergone a lot of heartache, a lot of social rejection? Perhaps they never got over the pain of the heartbreak, and therefore it feels like chronic physical pain. 
It's an interesting possibility, isn't it? If heartbreak could sometimes be the root cause of fibromyalgia, then treating the heartbreak might render better results than trying to treat the side effect of the physical pain. This may look like putting more emphasis on creating new supportive relationships, using cognitive behavioral therapy, or learning techniques like affect labeling in order to label emotions and identify their source, and to reframe that past hurtful story in their mind to be a more positive story like reflecting back on moments of heartbreak as learning experiences, experiences of putting ourselves out there and trying, versus the opposite of wondering, what if we never tried? And I talk about that in previous episodes, like the neuroscience of rejection and the neuroscience of starting over. Scientists have found that when they ask people to reflect back on their life, they were far more likely to bring up moments of missed opportunity, of regret, and that the pain associated with that was much stronger of wondering, what if? And later in life, when they looked back at their moments of rejection and social pain, it was less negative, it was less common, because they tended to take the approach of, well, at least I tried, and now I know. And the pain of rejection did not seem as significant as the pain of missed opportunity, as the pain of wondering, what if? So, for example, in an individual battling with heartache and the chronic long-term consequences to that, Taking the perspective of, at least I tried and now I know, may be able to help reframe the thoughts and emotions around that event, and hopefully could reduce the physical and emotional pain felt with the heartache. See, pain is a very complex phenomenon, and I think approaching pain knowing that emotional pain and physical pain are processed in the brain similarly might provide better insight and therefore better patient care. Tiffany Field in the journal Psychology wrote in 2011 about heartache and bereavement, meaning the loss of someone. In this review, they highlight how the loss of someone in our life can cause many physiological effects. For example, heartache could lead to intrusive thoughts, meaning that we don't want to think about it in our day-to-day activity, but the negative thoughts keep popping into our mind. As a result, this can reduce our attention control, reduce our efficiency, and may result in the development of insomnia. As a result, this can lead to potential negative adaptations, including immune dysfunction. And compromised immune dysfunction is thought to result from reduced vagal activity and increased cortisol and catecholamines, leading to increased inflammatory cytokines and decreased natural killer cell activity. As a result, inflammation may be elevated with this stress response. This then, in theory, provides more mechanistic rationale as to how feeling a heartbreak long-term could have negative health consequences for us. You may have also heard of broken heart syndrome, which medically is called Takasubo cardiomyopathy. The name for this heart condition comes from the Takasubo fishing pot, which is a narrow neck, which has a, a narrow neck and a wide base, and that's used to trap octopus in Japan. The reason why it's called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is because the left ventricle seems to take on the shape of this pot with the narrow neck and the wide base. This condition could arise in individuals with immense emotional pain, like after the loss of a loved one. The heart on imaging looks as though the left ventricle has changed shape and increased in size. And the left ventricle looks like this pot that is meant to trap an octopus. Now, the symptoms of broken heart syndrome are quite sudden and mimic that of a heart attack. Luckily, people typically recover within one month of the episode. Clinicians often recommend standard heart failure medications such as beta blockers, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, and diuretics to help the heart pump and to reduce the burden on the heart at the same time. This broken heart syndrome, or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, seems to happen exclusively in women which is an intriguing phenomenon and raises the question as to why. Are women more likely to feel the immense physical pain of an emotional stress? Does emotional pain manifest differently in women versus men? This is intriguing in the context of the foregone fact I shared at the beginning of the episode, where physicians observed hysteria more commonly in women than men in the 1800s. Now, not much else is known about this condition of broken heart syndrome. However, it is another example of how emotional pain, how a broken heart can manifest as physical pain too. And more research attention to social pain and emotional pain should be conducted 
considering its significant impact on our overall health. So that is a wrap, my people scientist army. A bit of a somber episode, so I apologize for that. But sometimes having the hard discussions, the difficult discussions, can be useful in preparing us for the hard times in the future. Heartache and loss is something we sadly will all likely face in our life. Understanding what might influence that could be helpful. For example, being vulnerable in relationships, but not necessarily dependent, may help safeguard us partially from severe heartache. However, understanding that heartache can impact our health, our sleep, our inflammation, immune system, and physical pain, hopefully can lead to better empathy and understanding when we or others go through heartache. This latest research provides some understanding to chronic pain conditions too, and how they may manifest from emotional pain. As a result, targeting emotional pain may render better outcomes for patients than trying to manage the physical pain. I hope that this episode gave us something to ponder. Thank you for bringing me into your day today. If you enjoy the show, then please consider telling a friend about it, leaving me a comment to let me know what you think, or even to buy me a coffee to say thank you for the show. The information on how to do that is in the description box to this episode. I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks, and I look forward to meeting you all back here in two weeks' time. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates. Thank you.